Good afternoon, nerd fam, and welcome back to Las Vegas, Nevada. It's a sizzler, not just because of the temps, but because of the conversations we're having here at Black Hat on the Cube. My name is Savannah Peterson, and we're going to jump right into this segment. I am absolutely thrilled to have Greg and Jesse joining me today. Gentlemen, thank you for making this happen. Yeah, hey, it's great to be here. Yeah, thanks for having us. I mean, I, I realized we kind of pulled this off quite quickly last minute. I met Jane on your team on my flight. Shout out to Alaska Airlines and Road what's 12. Her? Jane, what's up? You're a queen for making this work. But I love it. Right away when I sat down next to Jane and we were talking about Red Seal, I thought, whoa, wait a minute. There's This is a story and a product that, that more people need to know about. I wasn't as versed in you as I should have been. So, Greg, I'm going to let you take it away and just give us a little bit of a pitch about Red Seal. And then I want to get into why Jesse's sitting here with oh. us on stage. My pleasure. Well, we're here at Black Hat where individuals are here to protect themselves and their companies and the government and the world from hackers. And you can't protect what you don't know. And Red mm -hmm. Seal is a preeminent pre modeling technology to model your network so you understand all of the assets and all of the access points on your network um, without fail. And then once you know that, we want to prioritize vulnerabilities so you do the right things at the right time. Mm -hmm. We want to assist you in understanding the attack path so if something bad does happen, you know what they can get to right away. And then finally, we're going to assist you in continuous compliance. So we do all sorts of compliance, you know, CIS checks, this is STIGs, and we PCI compliance, and we're going to assist you in all of those areas. So four things, we do those four things on-prem, in the cloud, in the Metasphere, or wherever people compute. I love that. <laughs> that was perfect. That, we'll count that as a perfect elevator pitch. So, so you're, you're helping folks figure out what's going on. I thought this was interesting on your website. There's a piece of data. 76% of executives think they have the lay of the land within their network. But when you work with them, 100% of the time, you find unexpected things. Yeah, I kind of like into the old Federal Express commercial. When you absolutely positively need to know what's on the network, you go to Red Seal. So when we go in, mm. it's almost denial. We will go through a network and identify assets that are unknown, identify paths that are unknown. We even identify passwords that people shouldn't be using. And customers are in denial often when we do that. No, 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 that's not true. That's locked down. You can't get there. Or how about your IT and your OT network? Right. Our OT network is completely separated and segmented from our IT network. Well, often we have to share the information that that may not be the case. Yeah, so. yeah, I can imagine that's valuable. Which brings us to Jesse. Jesse, mm -hmm. CISO at Amtrak, yep. huge train fangirl, Amtrak fangirl over here. So I am just delighted that you could make time to join Greg and I today. What does it mean to be the CISO of Amtrak? What are you uh, thinking about? Wow. Uh, so it, it is, you know, anybody can look at my background. It is the most complicated, most difficult job I've ever had. Uh, and this is coming from someone who worked for the DOD and has done some crazy stuff for the career. Pentagon. Yeah, it was all in the DOD, around the world, at the Pentagon, you know, uh, nation state, you know, attackers. Like, that was my, my life 24 by 7 for, for quite a long time. And here you're saying Amtrak's harder than that. Yeah. Dig in. So it's, 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 a, it's, it's the, the, the scope and the age and the, 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 the mobility of it all. Um, so Amtrak's not just a passenger train company. It is, right? We are America's railroad. Um, but beyond that, we are owners and operators of critical infrastructure, transportation being the main one, but also energy, mm -hmm. emergency services. We have our own federalized police force, like 500 police officers you know, protecting our passengers and uh, taking care of the, the physical threats. Yeah. Uh, and beyond that, um, we are a real estate company. Think about how, how many uh, stations we have, 560 oh my gosh, stations. Oh, just the track itself. No, more than that, right? Yeah. So, yeah. so we only own about 1,000 miles of track, but we travel over... Uh, 22,000 miles of track. Whoa. So all the big class one freight railroads, uh, you know, provide us access to their, their tracks so that we can get around the country. Uh, so that means some other things from interoperability and mm -hmm. partnerships and third party risk, right? It's, it's so uh, very complicated. Pieces. And then uh, even, even what most people don't know beyond that, well, so there's some retail in there. Of course, you know, we take credit cards, we have website, yeah. we have mobile apps, so we do development. Plate. Yeah, and uh, probably uh, the biggest part of our business that people probably don't know about is we're a construction company. We're doing about eight billion dollars worth of construction work this year. That's bridges, eight billion. tunnel. Yes. Casual numbers there. Yeah. yeah. So I mean, the biggest projects we have, we're putting in four new tubes under the Hudson to help out with uh, traffic oh, in wow. and out of the city, Manhattan. Yeah. Um, building new bridges, uh, tunnels, uh, maintenance facilities. We bought like you know well over a hundred new train sets that are being manufactured by both Siemens. Uh, which is a cool. German manufacturer, but they're manufacturing here in the U.S. And Alstom, it's a French manufacturer building our new Acela trains here 
in, in the United States. So it's a pretty exciting time. Well, anyone who's ever traveled on trains knows ESL is the best. So that is very exciting. There's more coming. Yay! I love to hear that. Hopefully high-speed trains for us in the West here someday, too. Someday. Yeah. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> One can hope. It is an election cycle. If you're listening out there, we'd love some more transfer over here. How did you two, how long have you two known each other, Greg? So it's been a couple of years, a uh, little over, I mean, Black Hat last year, we spent time together and um, Jesse's been uh, a client for many years at, uh, at Red Seal. So, you know, but most recently in the last couple of years. Yeah. And what, what makes Red Seal an attractive partner for you? Um, well, if, if you think about the, kind of the, the, the scope and the breadth of everything that I just mentioned about Which having trains all the over record. the United States, yeah. infrastructure all over the place, uh, the, you know, the, our, our real estate footprint, yeah. um, the operational technology, the safety systems, the, the electrical systems, and, and even, you know, just that's the stuff beyond the traditional enterprise IT, which we have all that too. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, video surveillance cameras, like you name it, like absolutely everything that you think that might exist in a company's environment, it exists in Amtrak. And how do you wrap your arms around all that? At how do you even know what you have? I mean, the attack like starting path from, management, I'm just thinking about that as you're talking about that. So, Millions of pathways. Yes. Probably well, you, millions. Depending and if you think on how you about, um, if you th just think about any of the frameworks that people, you know, select and follow to build a strategy around, and you know, figure out what they need to do to protect their company. All of those frameworks start with, you know, understand what you have. You know, having an inventory of your hardware and software, knowing what's on your network. Mm -hmm. I mean, how do how do you know how to protect something if you don't even know that you have it? Right. So just mapping all of that out is is a huge challenge. And extensive. I mean, you're probably talking about legacy systems. You're talking about newer tech. You're talking about edge devices that consumers are using within the Amtrak app. I mean, you've got oodles of layers. Yeah, we have that. 19th and 20th century assets that we're trying to pull into the 21st century, as our CEO likes to say. Yeah. I mean, not all of that's tech, but I mean, we do have some pretty old tech out there, and a lot of analog stuff that we're now transforming and making digital. Yeah, that's. Fascinating, and what a challenge! I can see. I'm I'm catching up with now. Why you're saying this is the hardest job you've had? It's been, it's been a spicy one for you. I can I can tell. It's hot. Yeah. How does working with with companies, organizations as broad as Amtrak, help Red Steel develop a better product? Well, I think when you look at the diversity of devices and their network, for example, um, we have over 125 integrations with other cybersecurity partners in the industry, which That's are very important to what we do. Yeah. And we had to do those some specifically for Amtrak. Think of things moving around the country and devices mm -hmm. that have to be ruggedized on those trains and being able to track those. So um, when we have customers like Amtrak expanding our connectivity, making sure that we're working with partners that they want us to work with is really important. So that's how it enhances what we connect to for our other customers. Integrations are key. We as suppliers in cybersecurity need to think about integrating for our customers and not make our customers be integrators for us. And yes, making that, that experience seamless yeah, and, and so the, consistent user experience. So yeah. the better I can partner with other vendors to provide a solution for our clients, it's better for our client. Yeah. And they shouldn't have to be integrators of technologies that they need as a platform in some sense to solve the problem. So that's how it makes us better, mm -hmm. I think. That's one reason. There's so probably more. Yeah, so you're really a platform play in that extent. You're trying to pull all the pieces together so they can just plug in and know what's going plug on. Plug and play, that's what we want. Yeah, yeah. that's what everybody wants, right? Yeah. Give me that easy button, give me that yeah. plug and play, tell me everything I need to know. How hard is it to prioritize risk in these environments? Because once it's been evaluated, Jesse, how do you know what's the biggest risk? Um, so for me, it, it always comes down to like life, health, safety, right? So mm -hmm. when, when you're dealing with, uh, you know, the, the lives of uh, our American citizens every day and, uh, you know, right. they, they, they trust that we're going to take care of them on board our trains and that we're going to get them, deliver them safely to where they need to go. They trust that we're going to take care of the data that they've, uh, they've uh, you know, freely given to us so that uh, we can provide the best service pro possible for them. So, uh, you know, kind of an order of priority, you know, safety has to be number one. Mm -hmm. Amtrak has a culture of safety, and that's kind of how I tied my cybersecurity program into that culture of safety to make cybersecurity part of it. Uh, and uh, it, it gets prioritized from there. And... You know, beyond that, we just want to make sure that we're getting everybody where they need to go and having the best possible experience that they can have. Yeah, absolutely. And that's what I usually have on Amtrak. How about you? You're looking at a bunch of different companies across verticals from the government to, to private sector. 
Is it hard to help them prioritize? I, can, I mean, I can imagine everyone wants to take care of everything all at once. I think um, the key around us is vulnerability prioritization. So, yeah. you know, when you see something that has a CVSS score of a nine, and then you find out based on your red seal map and what you know, that that vulnerability doesn't touch anything that matters, that it's not going to affect um, something open to the internet or something yeah. that's affecting our critical data, then you can lower your priority. Now, imagine... Jesse and many others in this business are stressed for resources. You think every day, if you put yourself in the chair of a risk executive, you wake up in the morning and you decide, how am I going to allocate resources to best protect the organization to do what needs to be done? And so if I can move some of the noise and help them prioritize vulnerabilities mm -hmm. um, by understanding the map of their network and what has uh, capabilities to get to something that could hurt us, then that helps them understand where to focus their time. Jesse said, I got to worry about safety. I've got to worry about um, moving people to the right place yeah. safely. And so we're going to help them prioritize those vulnerabilities that they hear yeah. about to understand if it affects a train or a switching system or ticketing or something that may be critical to well, their environment. And at its core, what I'm hearing from both of you, it's a lot of data. We're talking about a lot of data and a lot of different avenues in which that can be compromised or affected or impacted or even just siloed into a place where it wouldn't be the same defense mechanism it would normally be. This problem is only going to grow exponentially. Yes, and I, yeah. I mean, I think you know, with what Greg was saying, it's really important for me to understand what the risk actually is. Mm -hmm. So, just knowing that something has a vulnerability doesn't really mean anything, right? right? What's what's the likelihood of being exploited? If that's exploited, you know, what can be exploited next? What can what's be compromised? Like, what's the worst case scenario? Like, what's, the case scenario? Yeah. what's the avenue of approach that a threat actor would take through your environment to get to you, your crown jewels or to your safety mm -hmm. systems or to the, the the train management system that controls what the train's doing? Right? That's pretty exciting stuff to be able to uh, see that. It is really exciting stuff. And I think as end users, sometimes we forget how fragile these ecosystems are when a system gets compromised. We've seen a little bit of that over the last few weeks. But it can be a really systemic meltdown when, when something happens. So I'm glad you're there on the forefront, Jesse, keeping an eye on everything, keeping us all safe on the train. Greg, when you look forward into the next couple of years, where are you guys going? Well, I think we need to focus on the four things that we do, um, both in mm -hmm. the cloud and on-prem. Um, I think the key for any technology is how fast can I deploy it? How easy is it for my team to use it and get reports and data out of it? You just said it. Cybersecurity is a big data problem. Mm -hmm. There's just there, It's just data related. Right. And so being having access to the data and being able to share the data. So I mentioned a little bit of IT, OT. Yeah. I mentioned our integrations. The data that we have is very valuable. We pull configurations from all the network devices. We keep that up to date. If I can share that data with other solutions, if I can make that data available to my customers when they need it quickly, then I think that's the future. It's access to the data, being able to use the data, share the data, and make it valuable to our clients. I, I, of course, ease of use, time to value, those are critical in any solution. Mm -hmm. um, because again, resources are scarce. Resources are difficult to get. And if I can make the least amount of resource used to get the most benefit from the product, I'm doing, a, I think, a service to our clients. I think so, too. Yeah. I'll, I'll affirm that. It seems like Jesse also affirms yes. that. Jesse, what about you? What's the 10-year, well, whatever you can share with us, like 10-year technological roadmap for Amtrak? I mean, I think uh, with there was a lot of what Greg said that resonates with me because mm -hmm. what we really want and what we need is is more of a, a mesh architecture, right? Mm -hmm. So that you know we, we're we're interlocking solutions together, and 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 we can't do that unless uh, you know our partners are playing well together, mm -hmm. and 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 taking care of those integrations for us. So that you know Greg drops his platform in our environment, we have other solutions that we want it to be connected to and interlocked with, mm -hmm. so that we can we can remove the seams in our defensive posture and and you know have better visibility and protection for for our customers and, and and the company itself yeah and continue to be a trusted brand I like everybody trusts Amtrak you're in, you're in a good spot you want to keep that up I would imagine what do you think is the greatest risk to our industry overall right now could be a conversation could be a threat you're closing us out, so I'm going to give you the tough questions for the day. Yeah. I'm I can tell you. I, I can tell you don't want to go first, Greg, which is why I'm kind of just letting us sit in this moment, which is adorable. Uh, just, all right, I'll, Jesse. I'll go. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I think I think we're seeing. So I'm I'm in critical infrastructure, and, and what I what I think we're starting to see now, 
and we've been seeing for a little while is nation state threat actors kind of testing the boundaries of what they can do in critical mm -hmm. infrastructure, in healthcare, in transportation, in yeah. energy, in, in water treatment, right? I mean, we, we've seen some, some boundaries being pushed there. And, you know, I, I think the, the biggest risk that, you know, that United States has is if they do nothing about that. If they don't take the right stances on policies, if they don't, you know, engage the right technical resources to, to push back where, where, where the, it can be pushed back, um, you know, the, the risk is just going to keep growing for owners and our operators of critical infrastructure, which is a which is a danger to all of us. Right. I really agree with what you just said there, Jesse. And I think one of the conversations we've had over the course of our segments this week is, is policy as a line of defense, mm -hmm. essentially. And I think it's something that people don't think about a lot, but I think you're absolutely spot on. No one is going to protect us unless we protect ourselves and agree what protection even looks like. That's right. So I think that's great. All right, Greg, we've bought you enough time. Well, you know, <laughs> coming from a background in incident response and dealing with nation yeah. states, um, going all the way back to releasing the APT1 report and exposing the world to the fact right. that we are under attack by foreign governments or foreign mm -hmm. actors, it's manifested itself in many ways. I mean, even ransomware today, uh, ransomware is a big problem that corporations face. Nation state actors are a big problem. They're, they can be one and the same. I mean, mm -hmm. ransomware is funding nation state activity. Right. And so I think being able to protect not only critical infrastructure, but the intellectual property, the IP, and the resources of our corporations and governments um, in our country, I think is a big threat, but it's in every country that is in the free world dealing with this. Um, you know, the cost of a cyber breach today on average is about $5 million, but when you look at healthcare, it can run up to $10 million. Probably the highest cost in repairing and dealing with a cyber breach is in healthcare, which is an area that may not have the resources to deal with this. So I, right. think, I think those level of breaches, both nation state and those acting in ransomware attacks are threats to us in the future, and we not need to constantly keep up and stay ahead of the game in those areas. Yeah, we absolutely do. I mean, the, the call out to healthcare is huge, especially with even just a lapse in information or data getting skewed. It, it isn't, you know, compromise. People can die. That's right. It's, I mean, yeah, I mean, it doesn't take much. Jesse, you've been all over the world doing work for the DOD. And speaking of nation states, Japan, Korea, are there any trends you can tell us from a geopolitical space? Is everything kind of blending together now in this era? What are what's going on? I mean, I don't think I don't think everything's blending together, mm -hmm. right? I mean, I do think that every nation state has their agenda, their mm -hmm. their, their plans, and uh, you know where they see themselves in the world in the future. Um, and I, I think there are some nation states that have. A, a more aggressive plans than others when it comes to where they want to see the United States, uh, you know, in the future. I would affirm that. Yes. And uh, so, so, and I, I think you can just figure out who who those might be just by mm -hmm. you know, reading what's coming out from from mm -hmm. the government. Mm -hmm. uh, but um, and and I think you know we 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 really at the point where we I, we do know who our friends are and who those are that are not our friends. Yeah, and and I I mean you you know the real truth. I think perception and reality is different when you look at where attacks are coming from, which yeah. is pretty cool. Wow, yeah, this has been super cool. Okay, I have one more question for you both. It's less hard than the last one. I okay. Promise. What you're fabulous guests, and we'd love to have you back. And I'm sure this is the first of many. So when we have you on, let's just call it next black hat a year from now. What do you hope to be able to say then that you can't yet say today? Greg, I'm going to give it to you first okay, since you copped course. out last time. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, I think what we want to be able to say is that we've um, one up or put together a, a set of solutions that are dealing with the current issues we're facing in ransomware, deep fakes. Of course, we got through this interview. Actually, we've gotten through this whole interview without saying AI. I think. I'm proud of Is us. that pretty amazing? Yeah. I, I mean, um, I, that was my goal. <laughs> now you blew it. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> no. So, so I think when you look at no, what the good. buzz is mm -hmm. at Black Hat um, right now and what people are talking about, being able to say that we have a, a, a path to success in those areas because it is a journey. It's never going to be solid success. I think a year from now to say, okay, that's behind us now. It's part of the process. Um, we know that that's part of doing business. It's part of where we are. We'll move on to the next thing because there will be one, mm -hmm. but we want to make sure that we don't see the same issues year right. after year, but well, we we're moving learn. forward and yeah. learning from it. Yeah, absolutely. Good answer. All right, Jesse, what about you? 
Yeah, I, I mean, I really hope we're not talking about AI at Black Hat next year, to be honest with you. Um, you know, I went to I the- love this hot take for me, by the way. So many people want to be talking about it. I love that you just, when we were in the hallway, you're like, I don't want to talk about AI. It's like, fabulous, let's not. But, but, but here I am. things to talk about. But here I am talking about AI, but or talking about not wanting to talk about AI. I, I just the think irony. it's like, you know, no, you know, enough, yeah. stop yeah. anymore, right? Yeah. But, uh, you know, it is it is a challenge that we all need to tackle, right? It's, it's I, I think it's just a part of, you know, kind of the way that we work, just like any other technology. I mean, it's just, you know, I think it's going to be as ubiquitous as like, you know, let me Google that, right? I mean, it's, it's just- You're absolutely right there, it, I think, yeah. I, I do think we are overthinking a little bit and and perhaps we're so, trying to solve the wrong problems. Uh, you know, me personally, I think that the, the, the problem that you should be solving before, you know, trying to solve with AI is solving your data security problem, solving you know data security posture management, right? Uh, so you know, I would I would definitely like to be talking about other things mm -hmm. because there are, there are other challenges out there that we need to be solving. I like that. That was well stated, Jesse. Greg, this is a knockout session. I am so delighted that you were able to be here. I got to give another quick shout out to Jane for making this happen. Also, want to say thank you to these beautiful production team back there grinning at me behind the camera. You don't get to see them, but they work hard every day in the sweat box to make us look fantastic. Shout out to John and the rest of the CUBE team who are back at home. And thank all of you for tuning in to our two days of fantastic coverage here at Black Hat. We're in Las Vegas, Nevada, but the train is ready to leave the station and head back to the studio. My name is Savannah Peterson. You're watching the CUBE, the leading source for cybersecurity news.